Okay, we're going to get and get started with the uh, next version of our LiDAR stuff. Um, you may know me from another, from my work location, and right now I'm on leave, and this is stuff that was entirely unrelated to what I do at work. It was fun. Oh, you going to turn that mic off? Eh. Okay. Kill it, kill it, kill it. There we go, that'll do it. Okay. Not as much reverb that way. All right, uh, so you can do LiDAR at home. I had, uh, about a year ago, I just had uh, an opportunity, one might say, that cropped up. A friend of mine said, you know, I got this used server I'll let you have for a couple hundred bucks. And I would say that to justify this expense to my wife, that I said, hey, I gotta do some science at home. But it probably paid a part. <laughs> so I got a, the used server, and I put uh, some extra memory in the server, got it up to 44 gig of RAM, uh, had to buy a SATA interface card because it was the, uh, that generation of, of Xeon server that the interprocess, uh, the communication on the motherboard for the data was underwhelming to say the least. Then I bought a third, four terabyte drive and two terabyte drive to hold the raw data. And then, you know, I've got my internet connection at home. So that's all I pretty much need. The software, uh, I used Ubuntu Linux 1804 and 1604. Cost me nothing, Liblas, nothing, Grass, nothing, Poodle and Docker, all nothing. You get the idea. All the software to do this is freely available on the internet and open source. So the workflow, bulk download the data from NOAA for the areas that I'm interested in, uh, reproject the LiDAR data from whatever projection it was in into a common projection as I was dealing with multiple projects. So I picked the Albers meters, NAT83, EPSIC5070 because that's what the NLCD data is in. And then I aligned the cell size of the products coming out to the same cell uh, footprint as the NLCD. And then I nested a 10 meter one uh, within it. So you'd have nine 10 meters within each 30 meter. And then I went ahead and had a, a roughly six meter one that was the uh, same footprint as that North Carolina data set of canopy height. And then I fit them together to make a mosaic. Uh, so downloading from NOAA. First, you've got to select your, you go to the NOAA website, you select your area of interest, and it'll light up and tell you the uh, data sets that are available, whichever year and, and data type that are there. And I gotta say this for NOAA's website, they make it really easy to bulk download. Because you just go in there, you select the area, this is uh, Virginia Beach County, uh, and well, no, Norfolk, sorry. Uh, and you just go to this bulk download link, takes you right here, tells you exactly the command string to get that particular data set in wget, and you say, hey, give it to you all, and then you know, overnight it pulls it all down. You're done. It's all in the same directory. Thank Kirk for me. <laughs> uh, and pre-projecting, uh, Poodle does make it easy once you get there. You must specify the horizontal and vertical EPSIG codes because uh, by default, if you just give it the horizontal, it will leave it in the same vertical, which I think by default is WGS84. No, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> leaves it in feet, I think, but you have to just specify it uh, in, uh, when you're doing that. Uh, Poodle, difficult to compile on what I was doing in 1604 Ubuntu. Um, that was with version 1.6. Uh, the later versions you can now compile fine, but uh, 6 was difficult, so I went ahead and installed Docker and got a Docker instance of Poodle, and uh, it kind of took over the computer. I couldn't do much else besides the, the running Poodle on Docker while it was running. I was a little surprised by that. So you just write a Python script, see ugly Python code, and just do a little command line substitution. You just build the command string to Docker run, and the instance and run the poodle command with the input and output and you're done. 
And you do that for as many tiles as there are out there. If Docker hadn't been so obnoxious about taking over my computer, I could do this several cores at a time. So anyway, uh, DM creation. Uh, I set, just manually set my cell size to approximately five feet, just to kind of match up with the North Carolina DEMs at five feet. I uh, sent the extent of the region manually for some of the projects. I was a little off. Uh, I'll point them out to you later. And then I just Im use RN LiDAR to import the, import the mean value of the ground points for every cell. And I would do it for the whole project. So I've got a 10 county project and just did it in one shot. It, not a problem. Uh, then you go back, you've got holes then for water and buildings and some dense vegetation areas. And so you need to interpolate those holes if you want to have heights of buildings and such. So you go back and recursively iterate using R fill gaps and use the P option with that. And that uh, tells it to keep the original values of the DEM and then just interpolate the areas for the extent that you want. I used a five cell area so that if you had a big hill next to a building, if you tried, went to a 30 or 40 cells to try to fill in under these shopping malls, you'd have a basement in your shopping mall. It would go interpolate down inward. So you want to do recursively small sets to fill in gradually. Doesn't take much for a house, but like I said, there were shopping malls and factories there that took about 15 to 20 iterations. And um, I needed that because I wanted to include buildings and canopy height for uh, because birds care about that, thinking long-term towards birds. So you download the NLCD, just use the R external to link the grass maps uh, to the grass map set. And uh, then I just set my region to a line for the 30 meter. And then I went ahead and, and manually set the XY coordinates to match up with the cell boundaries, and then set the 10 meter for that. And then uh, to get the 20 foot, I just reprojected the North Carolina data later, which is available up on Science Base. Reprojected that to Albers meters and took the, the cell footprint and just carried it on over to Virginia. Um, and so, processing it, uh, you need LiveLass. LiveLass currently doesn't want to compile on Ubuntu 18.04. It, you, um, it's just an old library. It's going to be replaced eventually by Poodle as the back-end LiDAR library. There is a proposed Google Summer of Code project out there for anyone who wants to jump on that. Um, so I just set up a virtual instance of uh, Ubuntu 16.04 under KVM and once I used Poodle to reproject stuff I just ran the, the analysis using that virtual instance. And then uh, we've got everything nested up and start doing some work. Use the base raster of a uh, five foot DEM and then did uh, use an RN LiDAR to do on the fly height above ground. Okay, so this is kind of what you get out of that. There's the 30 meter, this would align exactly with the NLCD. There's the 10 meter which is nested within three by three and then there's the 20 foot for the same area. Now this is the order I did it and this is a one uh, so that's one project, 2010. There's 2012, it's just how I downloaded them from Noah's website. That one got cut off a little bit when I miscalculated on my manual extent, but I was mostly interested in the, the Albemarle Pamlico, so I wasn't too concerned about it. Uh, and you just go on through and project by project, that was the biggest one I did, 2014. All right, and you merge them all together. This is the 10 meter version of the uh, canopy height for the area. You can see the areas, nice big forest down there and it just, you get some of the really tall trees up here. There's the, this is uh, Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge right there. That's why you see a little few more taller trees there. Okay, so uh, I simplified the heights and I needed to add the buildings. So I just, uh, forest height per USDA, the forest no forest break is at about five meters. They say four or five, I just went with five. And so I resampled to set the, anything zero, less than five meters, everything five or more to one. But I still wanted buildings in there so, I, so that I could do this comparison that way. So where do I get those filters? Well, it turns out Microsoft. 
about two weeks before I started this, they released all their building footprints as uh, JSON data. And so it's based on their one foot resolution Bing imagery. So I downloaded the uh, JSON, just did this little quick command string right here uh, using the OGR command from uh, Google. And about 10 minutes later, I had a geo package that I could bring in to the, uh, I brought it into QGIS just to verify that it looked okay. And then because I needed it in Albers meters, I just right clicked and export to a, another geo package in EBSIG 5070. Took hardly any time at all. The interesting thing is that on my laptop at work on Windows 7 at the time, I, I did the uh, conversion to, to a geo package from JSON. It took 32 gig of RAM and uh, about half an hour to do that on my Windows machine. At home on this other server for all of Virginia, it took five minutes and hardly, I don't know, hardly noticeable RAM. So I, I don't know what's going on with that. It may have been a Windows 7 thing. So then I just import the geo package in with VOGR and then uh, set the set the region to match the 10 meter canopy height layer, and then uh, do VDRAS, convert it to a 10 meter building. Uh, then I go ahead and, and uh, set an inverse mask and make holes where the building should be, patch it together, and now I've got my data set. So I end up with forced, non-forced, and building. Yeah, so I run our report with NLCD and the 10 meter merge later and uh, eliminate the no data areas. And this is what I get. You get a basic summary there. And the, you can look at this stuff and, and uh, the developed open space stuff, you know, the buildings increase, the forest decreases, no real surprise there. And then the barren land and deciduous forest, you're 90%, 92%, 92% of all the forest. But then you get down to the shrub scrub and it turns out about 80% of that is actually forest by height. And then you also look at the grassland herbaceous, about 40% that's forest, and then the emergent for wetland is about uh, almost 25% forest. Then if you look at the 2010 data, I was thinking, well, you know, hey, it could be that it's just the time, the age. Well, I went back to that 2010 data, which was the 10 county strip at the beginning I was showing you, and that was before the 2011 date of the imagery, and it's still 71% in that 10 county strip. So it's not an age thing particularly, it's just misclassification. And you can't really blame them. It's, it's hard to do that from a single pixel. But if you're gonna be using this data set, think about the shrub scrub. It's my opinion, personal opinion, that it's more likely forced than shrub scrub, at least in that data set. The 2016 is taking into account the LiDAR data sets that are available, so it should be better. And why are we doing that? Okay. Okay, why am I going backwards? All right, there we go. That's why. So that's not it either. Why is it going backwards on its own? All right, so uh, just, just because I could, could do it, um, I did a three by three analysis of the 10 meter pixels and summed the forest so that you just, it would be, if all of them were forest, it would be a sum of nine. And then you just go through and, and for each three by three neighborhood, divide by nine, and that converts you to a quick percent, just as another check, so, you know, four out of nine is 44%. And then you go back and redo the same look at the, the, uh, the classes, and it's just another way of seeing that, yeah, you get 79% of the shrub scrub is forced, and 40% of the grassland is, and a little bit less, but about close to 25% of the emergent wetlands. So still a work in progress. Uh, I had a hardware failure, <laughs> lost a couple of hard drives, so I've got to rebuild my raw data set and reprocess this again. Uh, there's a new set of, of LiDAR tools, white box LiDAR, that's been ported from the white box Java project over to R. That might help with some of the, the data pre-processing. Um, and I was looking at relative density at, at different heights, the percentage of points at each layer, uh, and both of my hard drives died, so <laughs> gotta start that again. And do a skewness analysis, 
and uh, then I'll start downloading some GBIF bird data and see if I can filter out the filtered out by breeding season and go from there. I'll see if I can do uh, more formal metadata for it and I'll share it with the folks who are interested. I've already shared it with uh, folks that are in uh, like the flat wildlife refuges in that area and some of the other folks that might be interested, but just go from there. It's just a fun side project, for completely unrelated to work, but you just get this bug sometimes and say, the thing here is I got this server, what can I do with it? Oh, well, let's see if we can come up with a novel way to recreate the DEM so I could do this using this grass method. And thanks to everybody who works with grass, the NOAA guys, making the bulk data access easy. Are you listening, USGS? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the poodle, uh, Martin Eisenberg came up with the LAZ compressed format. It's really awesome. It makes you really saves on hard drive space. Uh, poodle developers, good stuff with that. Emerald LSE project, it's a nationally consistent land cover data set. Those guys do a lot of work and it's a really excellent baseline data set. It's just something that that uh, I'm hoping that the inclusion of LiDAR data will improve the results and the other things that uh, you were talking about yesterday uh, about using the, the higher resolution imagery to improve that, that will improve it as well. So I'm looking forward to the results from that. And believe it or not, I will say this, thank you Microsoft for the building footprints. <laughs> All right, uh, and don't forget, you can try this at home. This is a um, little, tutorial that will walk you through exactly what I was doing. It's meant for folks with Windows or sample data from North Carolina in there. And step by step, if you know nothing at all about grass, you could use this and still generate what I was doing. And I think that is about it. All right, that is it. At least it's not letting me go any farther. So, <laughs> do I have any questions? Yes. Right. One of the things I was wondering, did you say how you take samples to that 10 meter threshold and then use the no, I just, value of that? I wonder if that might have power. The, the 10 meter uh, actually went back and, and did it with the 20 foot as well, the 6 meter. But all it was doing was generating the, uh, the canopy heights at that resolution and converting it to forest, no forest. So it's, it's just the canopy height at a 10 meter resolution, just fit within the, the 30 meter. So. Right, so was it like a, the max height for that 10 meter area? Yeah, yeah, it was the max height, okay. max height. I mean, that might be kind of overestimating it a little bit too, propagating that out. Yeah. And that's why I went back and did it again at the six meter resolution, because it still, right. it still was similar numbers even at six meter, which, and, and, and once again, that's why I went back and did with the other thing where you're looking at the sum of the, one, if it was just going to be 10% from just one pixel being high within that 30 meter, then that would have been reflected in that as well. Oh, the question was, how did you sample to the 10 meter? <laughs> Sorry, just for posterity. Uh, next, anything? Are you, ah, Vashik. Ah, uh, you know, I didn't really track it that closely. It just was in my computer incredibly sluggish. And part of that might have been the hard drive access speeds of, um, uh, of the motherboard, which was kind of really disappointing <laughs> for a server, at least on the, on the native SATA ports. It, it wasn't too, it was not good. That's why I had to buy an external SATA card and put it into one of the PCIe slots. That made it better. So, yes, Sylvia, uh, uh, I'm sorry. The question was, what was the memory consumption of Poodle? <laughs> Sylvia. Um, I was just wondering if you had compared it with sand and fish sand or sea. It's matching pretty well. 
Uh, the, the question was, was it compared to the uh, NC State Forestry forest, uh, vegetation classes? No, I have not done that yet. My hard drive died. <laughs> I have just rebuilt the server. I'm waiting for another hard drive to come in. And at that point, I can start doing some comparisons. But this is Virginia. This is not North Carolina. So, but I could download the North Carolina and do that. All right. Yes. I have not compared it, uh, sorry, the question was have I compared it to the Chesapeake Conservancy State of Virginia one meter? No, I have not, but I now that I know that exists, I might do that now that my computer's back. All right, <laughs> do we have any other questions? If not, I will release you. 